Ah, uh, hi, hello. Welcome to Digital Storytelling. Today we are going to talk about adventure video games genres. Uh, we have talked about genres before, if you remember, last week. But uh, in that occasion, we were talking about genres from the point of view of inspiration, the relationship between different media. Today, we are going to talk about games, about adventure games. What are adventure games? Why narrative is so uh, important in adventure games? Some authors have already approached the problem of video games uh, genre classification. Dylan Platten, for example, were differentiating between story-driven and simulation games. This connects with this idea we talked in the first lessons about how story and simulation could be two different approaches to games. That way, the games that were supposed to be more related to a story are the ones that include uh, survival, platformers, fantasy role-playing games, etc. While simulation games are those that are mimeting uh, reality. So they are just a way of playing through uh, the digital uh, environment the same way we would be playing in the real world. And that's why we call it a uh, simulation. My approach is going to be slightly different. I'm going to start by defining the components of the games. And then later we are going to go to the definition of genres, depending on how they uh, are representing in their mechanics. So we uh, first define the mechanics, then we'll define the genres. The first mechanic to take in consideration is the challenges. It's the most important. What are you expected to do in the game? Do you have to go from one point to another? Do you have to not die? Do you have to get as many apples as you can? All challenges uh, are uh, or can be represented in terms of narrative. But let's forget about narrative. What will the player need to do? And this relates to controls, because obviously that is what the player, you, the person who is playing, would need to do, but who would be able to do it? Controls. What the character will do. When I'm playing, I'm controlling the character, so it is what the character will do. If you don't see any character, the character is still there. If there is a first person point of view, if there is a first person point of view, there is still a character. So what about the story? The story will emerge from all the combination of different elements of the mechanics of the game, but also the uh, the introductory sequence, the cut the scenes movies, all these things. Story will emerge. A story will happen before the game, after the game. The story can be um, intertext. It could be uh, that the game is adapting another story or the game is referring to another story. So a story is something uh, that will be all around the game and it will emerge from the game, depending on the genre, in different ways. Target audience. When you design a product, whatever product you design, it is very important to think about what kind of person, what kind of audience, are going to be uh, uh, consuming the product. And the video games are no different. Video games are uh, usually consolidated in different target audiences. And uh, so obviously when you are a person who is a fan of this kind of video games, uh, that would uh, involve uh, some other taste, some other uh, attitudes, some other uh, products you might enjoy as well. And all these are part of what uh, it is to define the audience of the game. So who is the player? Who is the community? Uh, what is the community of players? Because 
right now we are not only talking about uh, single players we are talking also players uh, sometimes because they play collaboratively or in a competitive way but also because obviously we want the product to be enjoyed for more uh, enjoyed by more than one uh, player visual interfaces is also key in video games we cannot uh, represent something without graphics okay or we can in this story we use uh, the controllers of the playstation or the computer in the same way as any other game the only difference is that the way the story is told doesn't use uh, graphics at all it's all uh, conducted by an audio narration but in normal terms visual interfaces are also communicating what we know about the character they are um, embedding ourselves into the story they are delivering elements of the narration they are also uh, ex um, they are also uh, giving us the mood uh, uh, of the game they are uh, communicating this through a particular visual style or aesthetics so when you are thinking about the audience sometimes uh, for example the target audience have implications on the use of specific visual interfaces like for example the way games like uh, super nintendo games are considered to be more childish because the use of the graphics that are more cartoonistic or uh, you know uh, more um, re um, related to genres like cartoons that have been traditionally associated to to children but not all cartoonistic games are intended to be for children of course we have already talked about the way of understanding genre from a, a discursive uh, perspective so this way if genre emerge for the conversation between producers audience and the text itself or the group of text we need to understand the three positions in order to define better our genres. Narrative video games are going to be games that are uh, uh, created by specific authors, sometimes uh, authors with capitals, the people who have their own prestige in the world of video games. The audience, uh, well, uh, they can be cult products, sometimes not that popular. Sometimes they are extremely popular games. So it's not that easy to define the audience of the narrative games, especially because we are talking about very uh, large group of products. And then in relation to the features, well, we are going to talk about different subgenres, and each of them are going to have different game mechanics, different controls, and different styles. Okay, so remember, this module is about creating a prototype and uh, we are starting to narrow this a little more. It's going to be a narrative that is adapting a three-act structure. We talked before about using fairy tales. Okay, so these tales that are fantasy, that are originally addressed for children, that they have some kind of moral uh, element but forget about that. Those are the original uh, tales. And what we are going to do, it's a video game. So it doesn't have to be the same. What kind of video games we can work with? Well, we are going to see some examples. Conversational adventure, visual novel, interactive movie, graphic adventure, puzzle game, and living book. Let's see what we can do with it which one of these let's see what we can do with uh, each of these uh, games but first we are going to talk about adventure games in a more general way adventure games are those experiences where there is an interactive story and where the uh, main character is played by the player so Usually, we understand that the storytelling and exploration are quite important in the game. And then uh, there are elements of puzzle. 
uh, these are conceptual challenges, uh, not always puzzles in the way of traditional sense, but sometimes uh, finding an, uh, a particular route, a particular path, like uh, finding the way, or uh, uh, getting an object, or trying to sort out a mystery. Uh, getting uh, access to particular knowledge or a particular object is itself a puzzle. This, the elements of combat or um, uh, time reaction or uh, all the kind of challenges that are usually arcade are going to exist as well in these games, but sometimes are reused. Okay, So uh, they are not that important. They are just a part of the experience, but they are not the main element of the experience. These are some examples of challenges that you could uh, find in an adventure video game. And uh, it doesn't matter if we are talking about graphic adventures or puzzle games, some of them are going to be uh, common. These are bad examples of uh, the kind of uh, puzzles that we can find uh, in adventure video games. You should try to avoid puzzles that can be uh, clicking uh, anywhere, can be resolved, like, okay, I have to click somewhere, I will sort it out. That doesn't really work that much. Uh, we need to find uh, puzzles that works with some kind of logic. So try not to put uh, some kind of puzzles that only you understand how they work. So you need to, uh, to set up uh, things that are based on logic. Another concept that I found particularly fun is these FedEx puzzles. That it means like, oh, you have to go to somewhere to get that object and then go to the other place to deliver that other object. So they, they are called FedEx. It's, it's just that. Try to avoid that kind of, of uh, puzzles. So uh, if you want to explore a little more this kind of uh, adventure games, start from the beginning. Uh, the adventure game term uh, was originally associated to role-playing games. Uh, and uh, I'm talking about pen and paper role-playing games and also uh, these fantasy stories and all this. So, that is the reason that the first games developed without a uh, graphic uh, interface. They were uh, heavily based on uh, fantasy and science fiction literature. So you have things like, for example, the adaptation of the Hitchhiker Guide to the Galaxy, which was uh, um, a novel, and then adapted to a, a video game. So you have uh, also the adventure, which is this... Uh, conversational adventure with some graphic elements. As the platforms were evolving in the technological sense, uh, also the possibilities of uh, transporting audience to a new world. Uh, we can have uh, text adventures, uh, command-based interfaces, where you uh, write instructions like uh, CDs, get that, things like that. And then hybrid forms where that includes some kind of animation or representation of the character. And with this, we move to uh, the graphic adventures. Graphic adventures were immensely popular uh, in the 90s and in the late 80s. And uh, you have many good examples about this. Graphic adventures were uh, the consolidation of these narratives with menus uh, for the different actions and the inventories. They have also contextual menus. Okay? All these features have been uh, survived in current video games, so we still have examples of this. Graphic adventures were immensely popular, as commented before. Uh, there are so good examples. In the mid-80s, for example, we have this... Uh, uh, deja Vu, uh, which was um, Deja Vu, sorry, <laughs> my French is not that great. And uh, it was the first adventure uh, in Mac. And also Maniac Mansion, uh, this uh, very popular, the first game of LucasArts. There was some kind of rivalry between Sierra and LucasArts, the two main producers of adventure video games at that time. 
the focus on um, uh, Sierra was on creating uh, these contextual menus and making that way uh, a more natural approach to, uh, to the gaming and also the diversification of genres. While um, uh, LucasArts seems to work more on fantasy uh, and uh, products for uh, teenagers, uh, Sierra has also other games that were specifically designed for adult, adult uh, audiences and also for uh, children. There was even examples of the use of full uh, motion video or even uh, the use of 3D engines. So basically that is what uh, we are doing right now, but we are talking about the evolution of this particular subgenre. Another form of adventure games uh, are the interactive movies. Uh, probably you are familiar with the tell and tell, uh, telltale um, uh, games. So all of them are using the same game engine and they are very similar in terms of uh, movies, interactive movies, and also quick time events. These uh, moments where you have to click a button in the right moment to choice, uh, to choose between different actions. So when we arrive to Japan, the story is slightly different. Japan uh, is, um, is a country with a tremendous uh, popularity for uh, mangas, the comic books, and the animation, the, uh, the called anime. Uh, these uh, media have influenced uh, tremendously the adventure games. So they have this tradition of the visual uh, novel. And uh, the visual novel is similar to anime in the sense that they try to create a very simple uh, animations with very uh, sophisticated graphic design. There are many different kinds of Japanese visual novels and uh, some games have evolved uh, also to create uh, hybrids. So for example, we have Fenice Wright, his attorney, which is not exactly a visual novel, has elements of visual novel, but also elements of uh, hidden games okay, or puzzle games. But before uh, hidden games, the games you play, for example, in your um, in your mobile, there was uh, some years ago something called living books. Living books were expected to uh, use the most of a particular new technology at that time, which was the CD-ROM. So that allowed uh, uh, to create it, uh, more sophisticated graphics, uh, video compression, uh, high quality audio, and all that technology uh, emerged in the form of these uh, uh, living books. These were sometimes addressed to children and they were uh, very fun, but the gameplay was basically just touching in something and seeing what happened, like an immense tableau uh, full of uh, little animations that were triggered by clicking on the object. So nothing that uh, it is uh, amusing right now, but it's still very powerful in order to communicate some ideas to children. Why you don't spend some time right now to try this little game done by a student in Germany? I think it's very uh, interesting because it is not very clear exactly what is the purpose of the game. You are supposed to be a doctor in a psychiatric and you need to diagnose every single of the different uh, animals that they are here. And all of them are a little crazy. Take, for example, uh, Catherine, which was a very popular game at the beginning of uh, the last uh, decade. Uh, Catherine is only a puzzle game and it's very repetitive in their mechanics. However, it was immensely popular and this was due to its very complex narrative where it was mixing different memories and different perceptions of a um, character that is uh, worried about the infidelity of the girlfriend.
in this other game, uh, Professor Layton and the Curious Village. And all these series of Professor Layton, puzzles are not really that connected to narrative, but narrative is part of the joys of playing the game. The narrative and the nice visual design, which is mangesque or, if you want, similar to some of the Ghibli productions. So at this point, uh, you should uh, have now a better idea of what we uh, refer when we're talking about uh, narrative video games or adventure video games. And you are aware of the complexities of uh, classifying all these games as the same uh, uh, label of narrative. There are different kinds of narrative. There are different kinds of game mechanics. So let's start by defining the game mechanics. Once that you have defined well your game mechanics, uh, whatever you are referring to different genres, saying my game is similar to this genre or has this game mechanic from this genre, that would be great. That would be very useful. But that is not the most important. The most important is that you achieve the challenge of constructing your own prototype. So I hope uh, this has been fun. I hope you uh, discover something new about the history of video games and you enjoy this uh, presentation, this lecture. See you in the lab and uh, take care.